This session will focus on women's leadership in health. My name is Evelyn Carrillo. I'm the project director of Why Act Youth in Action at Amref Health Africa. As a young leader in the health space, I am more than thrilled to be moderating this town hall session that has two great speakers who are, who are trailblazers in the health space. I will be introducing them to you all shortly of the day. When it comes to healthcare globally, while women make up 70% of the world's health workforce, only 25% are represented in senior leadership positions. And when you look at purchasing in healthcare, women are the key decision makers for meeting the health needs of their families, and they make four out of five of health purchases. Given this, it will seem beneficial then for everyone if women were strongly represented in senior leadership in the health space. Yet, this is not the case. Data has consistently showed us a lack of gender parity in leadership in the health sector. Why is it then that the role of women in healthcare has not been elevated? Yet in the SDGs, particularly SDG 5, calls for women's full and effective participation and equal opportunities for leadership, including in the health system. If we look at literature around women's leadership in Africa, it really underscores, sadly, the persistent barriers and systemic challenges such as gender stereotyping, limited educational attainment, and discriminatory policies and procedures. So we hope that through this town hall session, we will look at the gender lens on women's leadership in Africa. We'll examine how women can claim a seat at the decision-making table. We will explore why it's important to tackle gender inequality and really create a platform to strengthen women's leadership. As I mentioned before, and to those of you who are joining us, this is an interactive town hall session. I will now introduce uh, our two speakers. They have extensive CVs, but I will try to summarize their experience before I ask them to give their spotlight. I will first start with Dr. Folake Olayinka. She is a global health expert and a leader. She is a physician and has served extensively in senior leadership positions leading diverse global teams with country programs in Africa, the Caribbean, Eastern Mediterranean, and Southeast Asia. She is also one of the 24 recognized women leaders in global health, participating in the first cohort of the Women Lift Health Leadership Journey. She's passionate about primary health care, specifically around women and children, and she serves on the WHO's strategic advisory group of experts. We have our second speaker, equally a trailblazer, Madam Lydia Solahu. She is the Senior Country Director of Pathfinder in Burkina Faso. She has close to 20 years of public health experience in reproductive and maternal health and organizational management in Africa. Uh, Lydia has taken her talents to the international stage. In her early career, she expanded her field experience in sociological research, focusing on the needs of married adolescents and really evaluating how gender issues intersect with family planning and reproductive health. She studied the management of local NGOs in West Africa and organizational capacity of reproductive health NGOs. So we will now start off this spotlight talk and I will ask Dr. Folake to take the floor. Dr. Folake, give us your spotlight talk your personal leadership journey and insights and also tell us any interesting fun facts about you as you give us the spotlight so dr folake thank you very much evelyn i'm really delighted to join lydia today on this very important uh town hall session dr folake um i can't hear you can you hear me now can you hear me now hello can you hear me now? Uh, I still can't hear you. Valerie, can you hear Dr. Folake? Or oh, you can all hear. Okay, that's good. Okay. It seems you can all hear me. So um, I will proceed. Um, I'm really delighted to join Lydia on this really important panel. It could not have come at a more important time for many reasons. Uh, first of all, um, honoring Women's International Day um also we're still in the middle of the worst pandemic in a hundred years but the third element i'd like to also highlight is that this is also a time that very 
hard questions are being asked about leadership and diversity and gender equity in leadership. So I'm really, really honored and humbled uh, to be part of this discussion today. We know that women's leadership in health is not optimal. In fact, it has suffered a lot of setback, suppression and repression. But in recent times, it is becoming clear that women bring unique skills and expertise that are absolutely critical to health leadership. While 1995 was a defining year for women at the Beijing conference in which women's leadership and equality was elevated, more recent efforts through the United Nations, uh, Melinda Gates, advocates such as Dr. Moeti, the regional WHO director for Africa, Yodi Alakija, Dina Mired, Michelle Berry, so many others are on the front lines of reigniting the focus and need for women in health leadership. But much more needs to be done. We are nowhere near where we need to be. What makes it difficult for women to be in health leadership is a question that Evelyn has asked us to speak about. And when I reflect, I can pinpoint one very critical aspect, and that is the lack of clear pathways and opportunities for women in health leadership. These are often pathways that have been designed for men and by men and have not placed sufficient value intentionally charting leadership pathways for women. Personnel and human resource policies have not been reconfigured to include policies that promote gender equity in employment and leadership. For example, women often have to think about childcare differently from men. In fact, I myself have had to travel with my young child and pay for a nanny to accompany me for official work. Can we have policies that cover this as part of the job? The pandemic has shown us that a lot is possible, a lot of flexibility and changes need to come into personnel and ensuring that we have a productive workforce. The decision making by women in health leadership have shown that women bring exceptional skills in communication, empathetic leadership, ability to inspire teams and others, confidence, and they are focused on making the best decisions as part of their leadership skill set and in fact, are less concerned about ego um, as part of their leadership skills. Most people agree leadership is mostly about listening and communication. Women are actually unmatched in this regard. When I look at myself 25 years ago in my own leadership journey, I, I wish I had had mentors uh, to guide me through the pathway. And I look at it that as a highly trained and highly skilled professional, there were many issues that I had to encounter and overcome at a personal level, at an individual level. I think that having these changes and adaptations at an institution level is absolutely critical for us to encourage more women in health leadership. And just to wrap up, I would just like to give you a, a very brief uh, story about my own uh, journey. Um, as I moved from working at a national level um, in, in Nigeria, my country of origin, and I started working at the global level um, with covering diverse groups, leading diverse teams, um, working in one of the largest bilateral agencies at a leadership level, I learned that I need to retool myself. I needed to reinvent myself and I needed to learn new set of skills to be able to provide the kind of leadership um, that I wanted to have. And this leads me to programs like um, as Evelyn mentioned, I'm very, very pleased to say I'm amongst the 
24 amazing women leaders in health that are in the Women Lift cohort uh, for women's leadership, really grooming women to take top leadership positions and providing them the skills to handle very complex global health issues. We need skills, we need the opportunities, we need the pathways. So thank you very much. And I'm sure as we go into the conversation today, uh, we'll be able to get much more into these details. And I'll, I'll be very happy to share much more about my own journey uh, as I'm based now in Washington, DC in a leadership executive position in a large bilateral agency. Thank you. Evelyn, back to you. Thank you, Dr. Folake. Very inspiring words. I like what you said, you know, that you're putting out effort to learn new skills, that we need skills, we need opportunities to really ensure that women have the right place in leadership. We'll now turn over to Madam Lydia. And I just want to let our audience know that Madam Lydia will, uh, you know, interchange from French to English in our remarks or English to French. So feel free to use the interpretation icon. And as you do so, remember to put off uh, the original version so that you can have a clear audio. When we get back to English, remember to switch back to the original version. So Madam Lydia, the floor is yours for your spotlight talk. Tell us about your personal leadership journey, really what organizations should do to address gender inequality, and also tell us any fun facts about you. Okay, merci beaucoup. Merci de m'avoir invité à cette session. C'est vraiment un honneur pour moi d'être présent et de partager mon expérience. Je pense que je vais partir de ce que Dr. Poulaké a dit à partir de là pour continuer. C'est vrai, je vais... Je suis actuellement directrice de Pathfinder au Burkina Faso, mais auparavant, j'ai été directrice à Population Council, euh, à IPC, qui est une organisation alliée à International Alliance. Et aussi, j'ai travaillé au bureau régional de IPPF au Kenya. Je pense que cette question est très importante et, et fondamentale. Et je suis très heureuse de pouvoir participer à cette session. Je voudrais commencer par une anecdote sur mon histoire à moi. Je me rappelle en 1997, euh, j'ai participé à un interview et pour moi, ça s'est bien passé jusqu'à la dernière question où un des panélistes m'a demandé, euh, vous avez combien d'enfants? J'ai dit deux et il m'a demandé, vous comptez avoir un autre enfant? Euh, j'ai demandé pourquoi? avant de répondre, parce que pour moi, c'était une question personnelle. Et il a dit, oui, c'est important pour nous d'avoir cette réponse, parce que notre programme est pour trois ans. C'est un projet, nous devons rendre des résultats. Et si vous comptez entre les trois ans prendre une grossesse, ça veut dire qu'on aura à peu près moins de neuf mois et ça peut impacter euh, les résultats de ce programme, alors que ce programme s'occupait vraiment des femmes, de la santé des mères, de la santé des femmes en grossesse, mais moi, je devais regarder autrement par rapport à la question qui m'est adressée. Et j'ai refusé de répondre à cette question et je n'ai pas eu ce poste. Peut-être que euh, les autres étaient plus performants, mais c'est quelque chose qui m'avait marqué parce que je me dis... Euh, ça ne peut pas être un élément discriminatoire qu'on peut poser comme question, parce que si j'étais un homme, peut-être on n'allait pas me poser cette question-là. C'est pour vous dire que c'est vraiment parfois des, des, des éléments que les gens ne font pas attention, mais qui créent une grande différence et qui bloquent euh, les jeunes femmes à, à évoluer. Après cette anecdote, je voudrais vraiment vous dire que je suis une femme qui est très engagée, n'a pas peur de parler et de dire ce que je pense. Euh, je suis connue dans mon pays par rapport à mes prises de position pour les femmes et pour les jeunes filles et pour la participation des communautés. Et je pense que je suis forte dans le sens où j'ai été éduquée par une mère qui était forte et qui a donné beaucoup d'importance à l'instruction de ses enfants, filles comme garçons. Mais cela ne veut pas dire qu'à l'intérieur, les garçons étaient plus libres de jouer au football, 
de faire autre chose pendant que les filles travaillaient à la cuisine pour aider euh, les parents. Mais cela m'a fortifié par rapport au fait que cette différence, je j'ai voulu travailler dans le domaine. Donc, j'ai fait beaucoup de recherches anthropologiques, euh, sociologiques pour comprendre quels sont les espaces d'expression des femmes et comment rendre les femmes autonomes. Et je pense qu'il y a beaucoup d'espace au niveau sociétal que nous, nous pouvons utiliser pour aider les femmes à vraiment pouvoir prendre des positions, prendre euh, des positions au niveau, au niveau de leadership. Dans mon pays actuellement, je pense que j'ai tellement travaillé avec les hommes que je crois que mes points de vue sont considérés et parfois ils oublient même que je suis une femme. Et je vois que ce n'est pas la situation avec les autres femmes, surtout les plus jeunes, qui ont des potentiels, qui ont étudié et qui doivent vraiment prendre la relève. Mais c'est à nous les seniors de créer cette relève-là. Et je pense qu'avec l'établissement d'une plateforme qu'on appelle Women Global Health, c'est aussi une plateforme pour nous pour pouvoir identifier des candidates potentielles que nous, nous pouvons coacher et amener à des positions très importantes. Je parle de coaching parce que moi, j'ai eu ce coaching quand j'ai commencé à travailler et à prendre la direction de certaines organisations où j'étais jeune. J'ai vraiment eu des personnes qui m'ont coaché, qui m'ont aidé, d'autres femmes surtout qui m'ont aidé à pouvoir ne pas avoir peur, pouvoir m'exprimer. Mais surtout, je voulais insister sur quelque chose. Mes superviseurs qui étaient des femmes m'ont permis de faire des erreurs et d'apprendre de ces erreurs-là. Ils ne m'ont pas laissé dans ces erreurs et dit, tu n'es pas capable de faire. Ils ont été là pour dire, ça, c'est une erreur, mais tu peux être plus créative. Et donc, cette flexibilité m'a permis d'avoir plus confiance en moi et aussi d'être plus créative dans ce que euh, je voulais faire. Et ça m'a vraiment donné euh, une forte personnalité. Et actuellement, euh, depuis plus de cinq ans, je travaille directement avec euh, le ministre de la Santé parce que je gère un des gros programmes du ministère de la Santé en tant qu'agence fiduciaire pour le ministère de la Santé, pour leur permettre vraiment d'utiliser les fonds de manière euh, suivant les protocoles et les procédures pour pouvoir atteindre euh, euh, la marche vers la couverture sanitaire universelle au Burkina Faso. Je vous remercie et je suis prête pour toutes les questions que vous voudrez bien me poser. Merci beaucoup. Au revoir. Thank you very much, Madam Lydia. I'll just ensure that everyone is mute. Okay, great, the echo is over. Thank you very much. You know, when I listen to Madam Lydia and Dr. Folake, I'd say these are experiences that most of us as uh, women leaders have gone through. You know, they've talked about inequalities in the workplace, gender stereotyping that women cannot grow the career ladder just like others, you know, unpaid care at home. But then there are also positive things, you know, and I listen to Dr. Folak and Madame Lydia, there are quite a number of positive things that we can only be effective leaders as women when we are our true selves, when we are our authentic selves as women leaders, putting out our skills out there. And the fact that we also need mentors, coaches, we need to leverage resources for learning and skills. I'll just uh, have uh, Dr. Folak and Madam Lydia answer a few questions here. I also want to remind you all our audience that you can post your questions on the chat. Uh, you can also raise your hand. And when we get to the Q&A, we'll alternate between questions on the chat and, uh, you know, participants will have raised their hands. So Dr. Folake, you know, when we started, we talked about a few statistics. The fact that uh, women make up 70% of the world's health workforce, but only 25% are represented in senior leadership positions. As a physician, do these statistics shock you? And why is it so hard then for organizations to achieve gender parity and really to do away with gender inequality in all forms, including in leadership? So thank you very much, Evelyn, for that, uh, for those questions. 
Um, these are really um, at the heart of what we need to talk about today and continue to have these kind of conversations. One thing I would say is that change is never easy. And there are many, um, there, there are many incentives to not changing. And I think this is really where we need to establish um, the process, a very clear process for that change, but also to remove the incentives around maintaining the status quo. It is not okay to have only men in leadership. It's not okay to have only 10% of women in leadership. It is not okay to have manuals. Um, I recently turned down a, um, a speaking um, um, offer at a panel because I saw the whole panel were all men. And this is an issue that pertained to women's health, children's health. And so I think we need to remove the incentives that continue to perpetuate um, reduced representation of women in leadership and create change pathways at an institutional level. And this means at a board level, what percentage are intentionally dedicated to women in leadership? Oftentimes they say, well, women don't bring board experience. Well, because they've never had the opportunity. But I think, again, part of that change pathway is creating a program that allows women to learn on the job or that creates pathways for them to, to, to be skilled and upskilled in this area so they can take the position. It's no longer okay to say women don't have uh, the skills. We have to create the pathways for women to bring those, those skills. The other thing I would say is that um, more diverse leadership means more inclusive decisions. And oftentimes those decisions would look very different if women were engaged uh, in the process. And so again, it is really ensuring that institutions have diversity, equity, inclusion, processes, human resources included and integrated into their institutional level. This is where we're going to begin to see the type of change we want to see and to see more women in health leadership. I would, very, I would be very remiss if I say that, uh, if I don't say it's not all right to leave it at an individual level, which I think is a lot of part of the, the challenges we have had. We've often left women to try to chart this pathway by themselves, but we must bring in the institutional changes um, the human resource policies and the policies at a board level that define the culture within health leadership that are more inclusive, more diverse, and that bring the policy, but also the practice of bringing women into health leadership. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Folake very powerful words there. I, I can't even try to summarize this. I'm sure the audience is as excited and really learning from you. I want to ask uh, Madam Lydia one quick question before we open this up to the audience to you know, ask questions and give comments. And I know Madam Lydia, you uh, touched on this briefly in your spotlights, but I just wanted to find out, especially as a young woman, uh, and I'm speaking as a young woman, that is, when it comes to, you know, ensuring that as women leaders, we are supportive of other women professionals, what approaches have you found useful, uh, especially in passing on the baton to emerging women leaders and making sure that those leadership transitions are smooth and are, you know, quite effective? Madam Lydia? Merci beaucoup pour uh, cette question, très intéressante. Uh, avant peut-être de répondre la question, je peux dire que je fais partie uh, d'un groupe de coach pour uh, les femmes féministes au Burkina Faso qui a été mis en place par Équilibre et Population. 
Euh, c'est un thème parfois qui fait peur aux femmes en tant que telles, parce que dès qu'on dit féministe, les gens ont peur de ces femmes parce que c'est comme s'ils sont contre les hommes. Et donc, quand on est jeune, on ne veut pas avoir cette étiquette-là parce qu'on peut ne pas avoir un homme qui va vouloir vous marier en tant que tel. Mais je voulais partager euh, ce que je suis en train de faire au niveau de Pathfinder. On a aussi, c'est une institution, euh, et comme l'a dit Dr. Foulaké, avec la manière, les procédures de recrutement, souvent ce qui ressort, ce sont les hommes. Peut-être qu'ils prennent des positions, ou d'autres femmes, ils prennent les positions par rapport à l'argent. Mais dans le domaine où nous travaillons, c'est vrai, il faut avoir un salaire, mais on a besoin d'engagement. Parce que je ne pense pas que le travail que nous faisons pour les autres femmes, on puisse vraiment payer ce travail-là. C'est très important de croire en ce que nous voulons faire pour les autres, du fait que nous avons le privilège d'être allé à l'école, d'avoir un diplôme, de comprendre beaucoup de choses. C'est de notre devoir de pouvoir créer ce changement-là. Et donc, c'est pour dire que pour les jeunes qui veulent vraiment travailler dans le domaine, le plus important, c'est l'engagement. C'est avoir un rêve pour les autres femmes. Et ce rêve-là vous permet d'aller très loin, de ne pas tomber lorsque vous êtes euh, sous les critiques, etc. Vous avez une ligne de conduite et vous avez vraiment un travail à faire pour être intègre par rapport à votre discours, par rapport à ce que vous posez comme acte. Et si vraiment c'est votre rêve, vous ne pouvez pas ne pas y arriver. Il y aura toujours d'autres personnes qui vont vous donner la main pour y arriver. Et ça, c'est important. Et je voulais donner l'exemple que je fais actuellement au niveau de Parfunder. Nous avons développé un plan de succession. C'est-à-dire que je dois pouvoir préparer une autre femme à pouvoir être dans une position de leadership au niveau de l'institution, soit au Burkina, soit dans un autre pays. Et donc, actuellement, j'ai mon député que je suis en train de former et d'initier par rapport à ce que j'avais l'habitude de faire Etc. Et donc, je pense aussi que ça, c'est des, des, des outils qui sont très importants parce que le recrutement sur la base de la concurrence, on oublie de regarder le potentiel que les femmes ont. Elles n'ont pas l'habitude de parler, mais elles ont un potentiel que si on les intègre dans une organisation, on les accompagne, elles peuvent vraiment éclore et faire de belles choses pour les autres femmes. Merci, Aube. Thank you very much, Madam Lydia. And I hope uh, all the young women who are learning from these trailblazers are getting a few tips. Thank you so much for those comments. I can see questions streaming in fast. And so we will start off with uh, a question here from Tamari, and she's addressing this to Dr. Folaki. How do we as women leaders position ourselves for health, social and economic transformation in Africa so that we can optimize our potential within the same spaces that men occupy. Thank you very much for that uh, question. I, I would say that the first thing is we must have a vision and a dream for ourselves. Um, let me quote the words of Her Excellency, the former president of Liberia, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. And she said, the size of your dreams must always exceed your current capacity to achieve them. If your dreams do not scare you, they are not big enough. So I would say at the outset, women in Africa, we must have a dream and a vision of leadership for ourselves. In terms of positioning, moving on from having your dream, I would say we need to upskill ourselves bring your A game. Uh, as a young uh, global health professional, there was no task that I felt was too small. And I tried to um, volunteer for different opportunities. In volunteering or in doing tasks, big and small, I always try to excel at them. And very soon, I in fact did build a reputation that if you want to get the job done, if you want excellent results, engage Dr. Falaki. 
And so you build a reputation for yourself. And in this process, you begin to also try to understand your environment. Um, I was in a leadership position. In fact, I was leading the, the largest malaria program in, in Nigeria, um, almost about, I, I would say, nine, nine years ago, eight, nine years ago. And throughout this time, my predecessors had been men. Uh, coming into this position, uh, I found that because they were so used to men taking leadership and decisions, um, I would even have my team inadvertently calling me sir. Um, now, I, I found that quite amusing, but what I realized is that it was a, a cultural reflex that most times the people who are sitting taking decisions are men. And so the cultural reflex was showing in, in this way. Uh, of course, I was amused and I laughed it off. Since then, I have worked with uh, international teams um, based here in, in Washington, DC, where I have a very diverse staff from all different countries. And I've learned how to, to, bring, to bring in diversity, to be listening, to be more flexible. And so for us to bring change to health and social sectors and economies in our countries, we need all these skills. And then I would also say, um, have a mentor and be a mentor. Just building on from what Lydia said, we also need mentors to share their experiences, to help us navigate difficult questions in safe spaces. Um, for many years, I, I could not put a word to misogyny. I had experienced it similar to, to Lydia. That was misogyny. Um, I had experienced a job offer um, after competing um, with many, many candidates. Um, I came out as the top candidates. Um, and at the end, I was told I would not be offered that position because I was a woman. It was many years later I understood that to be misogyny. Um, so having mentorship, having mentors, and being a mentor are important in terms of helping young women, others on the pathway of leadership to navigate through um, the different leadership steps, the skills, but also how to conduct yourself. Um, in the face of challenges such as misogyny, how to conduct yourself with diverse group of people, how to be inclusive, how to use your power as a woman leader. Um, let me end by saying that positioning to play important roles in health, social, and economic sector also means that we must have allies. Um, we must have allies um, from men from other leaders, from civil society, from other champions. It's important that we, we, we embrace a comprehensive shift. Uh, together, we are stronger. And collectively, we can create the shifts so that more women that are in leadership in social, economic, and health sectors become a reality. Um, back to you, Evelyn. Thank you, Dr. Folake. Very brilliant. And I do agree with you. We need to bring our A game as women leaders, but we also need allies. We cannot be effective on our own. We need all sectors to really support and ensure that policies are in place for women's leadership in health. And I want to segue you know, to Madam Lydia. On the issue of ensuring that women uh, get to accept opportunities in organizations that promotes gender equity. What else can you uh, advise women leaders when it comes to looking at organizations that they should work for, that they should say yes to? What are those key tenets that women leaders should really be, um, ha should really have as their minimum ask so that then we ensure that we are making a stand for gender equity and ensuring that women's leadership is upheld in organizations? What would you tell them to look out for?
Thank you. Euh, merci beaucoup pour cette question. Je pense que c'est parfois une question assez difficile parce que en termes de mobilisation de ressources, nous allons chercher l'argent dans d'autres organisations où parfois c'est très important de pouvoir regarder le pourcentage entre ce qu'on met comme euh, financement des ressources humaines uh, et ce que nous mettons. Financing of human resources. Et ce que nous mettons vraiment sur le paquet de, uh, des activités. Et donc parfois, cette balance crée... Activities. Cette, cette balance crée une certaine difficulté. Parce que quand on veut travailler sur les questions de genre, c'est sûr que faut beaucoup plus de ressources pour pouvoir regarder comment aider les femmes à rentrer dans l'organisation, à les maintenir, etc. Et en regardant que les procédures de sélection, c'est souvent très difficile de pouvoir amener les femmes à des positions de leadership parce que dans les interviews, ce qui ressort, je parle de mon pays, ce sont les hommes qui ont l'habitude de parler qui savent vraiment uh, parler ce vent. Ce qui montre que nous saying. avons un travail à faire avec nos sœurs pour leur apprendre à parler en public, à se vendre et à mm. montrer ce qu'ils sont capables de faire. Ça, c'est un. Mais je pense qu'au-delà de tout ce, ce qu'on fait au niveau des procédures, on doit regarder quel est le potentiel que la personne, la femme, cette personne-là peut venir créer dans la structure qu'on est en train de, de mettre en place. Ce n'est pas toujours les premiers qu'il faut amener. Il y a des femmes qui ont des potentiels, qui veulent juste qu'on appuie un bouton pour qu'ils puissent vraiment agir, puissent vraiment changer les choses dans leur communauté, etc. Et je pense que euh, quand on regarde les politiques genre et autres, je, je les trouve parfois raides et c'est la manière d'opérationnaliser ça dans l'organisation qui est le plus important. Et on ne peut pas opérationnaliser cela sans l'émotionnelle intelligence, c'est-à-dire vraiment comment on travaille à créer des conditions qui permettent que les individus puissent s'épanouir, puissent vraiment développer leur créativité et puissent vraiment montrer ce qu'ils ont comme potentiel et qui peut aider euh, l'organisation en tant que telle. Et ça, ça demande vraiment qu'on ait des fonds. Mais je pense que le COVID, l'avènement du COVID nous a appris que c'est possible de pouvoir vraiment travailler ailleurs, pouvoir euh, avoir des femmes qui peuvent travailler de la maison et donner pleinement satisfaction. Je pense que c'est quelque chose qu'il faut qu'on regarde euh, en face et qu'on voit comment on peut intégrer ces éléments-là dans notre manière de travailler et comment à travers... Euh, ce travail-là aussi, on peut aider des femmes à pouvoir se positionner. Mais si on, on prend les politiques comme elles sont et on veut les appliquer, parfois c'est très difficile et ça exclut plus ou moins les femmes. Il faut plus les humaniser et pouvoir le remettre dans le contexte qui est de, de chaque pays pour voir comment aider vraiment les femmes à prendre des positions et surtout à parler. Merci. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Lydia. I just want to uh, remind our audience that we have the interpretation button right at the bottom of your screen. And when you select either English or French, uh, please ensure that you mute the original version so that you can have a clear audio. When we are back to English, remember to put that uh, off. Madam Lydia, thank you so much. Um, I want to turn over to Dr. Folak and I see a question here from Donna Ayona. Uh, to you, and she asks, would like to hear your thoughts on legislating women representation in laws, and most importantly, how do we ensure these laws are implemented in the light of entrenched patriarchy in our societies? Dr. Folake. Thank you very much for, for that question. Um, I think we have, um, have universal charters um, that have promoted women uh, leadership and that have promoted gender equity in leadership. Um, we have, uh, as I mentioned before, the Beijing Conference. You have the SDGs. You have the the U the various UN charters. Uh, in fact, you have UN Women. Uh, all these are agencies, uh, global agencies that provide backing um, for gender equity, particularly in leadership. 
However, they have their limitations. Um, and so the aspect of legislations that um, support women leadership, uh, equity in women in leadership, I think is absolutely important. Um, these create the avenues and the channels uh, for women who to, to be brought into uh, women uh, into leadership positions. They're very, very important, particularly in societies that have had a very long history of patriarchy. As I mentioned before, um, most of the pathways that we have have been for leadership have been created by men and for men. And so in order for us to create the pathways for leadership, women leadership, we do need to have enabling legislation uh, that creates the spaces and that ensures that institutions and agencies draw down on those legislations um, and can incorporate into their policies uh, the kind of policies that will enable women in leadership to actually take place. Without the legislation in many, many countries, uh, the ability for women to be in leadership positions um, remains very remote. Uh, so certainly um, this is an important aspect of gender equity uh, in leadership. It, it, like I said, there are many global charters um, around women in leadership and many of the global institutions are making some progress. But unless we have the legislation, that progress will remain very slow, um, unintentional, and often in the hands of, of men, uh, which makes it even more, um, more challenging. Unless, of course, the men are allies. And as I mentioned before, um, we need to have allies at different levels, um, in different communities, um, in leadership, in politics, in governance, in the communities, uh, men as allies are important in this leadership journey. Civil society are really important in helping to shape and craft um, these type of legislations and policies, but they're also important in helping to keep everyone accountable to implementing them as well. Um, I think one of the most powerful reports that came out, uh, I believe about two years ago, is this leadership, where in health, we know that only 25% of women uh, are in leadership positions. Meanwhile, they are the, the major health force uh, of up to 75%. And so to change this, we really need to look at uh, the legislations um, that countries have uh, that are supportive of the changes. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, change is not easy and there are often incentives not to change. The legislation helps to create the incentives to make those changes. It also creates a platform to, to, to provide awareness um, around where a particular country is in terms of diversity, gender, uh, equity, and where they need to be in a very transparent way. And so um, just to end, uh, the legislation is an important tool to enact and to support women leadership in health in many, many, many countries. Back to you, Evelyn. Thank you, Dr. Folake. Indeed, legislation is an important tool. And you know, there's an interesting question that has been asked here. Uh, because when it comes to you know ensuring that women's leadership is effective, not just in healthcare, but in all other sectors, we need legislation. We need policies. And I see um, Sakina asks, we need to support women who lead projects in the sector of medicinal plants. And this is really about ensuring that uh, women have uh, access to the right environment for all the entrepreneurship endeavors to ensure that they're really contributing to the economies of Africa. Dr. Folati, when you look at 
other sectors beyond health. What do you think is lacking when it comes to ensuring that women have an enabling environment to really advance their leadership? What is it that governments need to do? I know you've talked about many instruments that are available beyond health. What more needs to be done? Thank you very much for for this question. I'm I'm really fascinated, and um, I hope that we are learning as we are um, exchanging. Uh, thank you for that question. Beyond health, um, we really need to look at our educational systems. Um, there are deep seated educational um, ethos, particularly in in Africa. Um, that has perpetrated, um, in a sense, has perpetrated the, the myth that men are best suited for certain uh, jobs and uh, certain leadership and women are more suited for others. At the same time, education has also created the pathway for women to rise into leadership positions. Um, as Lydia was sharing, in terms of her education, um, she was able to pursue her education uh, based on, on the, the background and, and the strength that her mother brought. I would say in my case, I had a father who would always tell me, you can do anything you want to do, you can be anything you want to be. And so creating equal opportunities for men and women in educational systems is absolutely important. Moving into the field of um, even furthering your education, oftentimes women are penalized because they've had to take time for childbearing uh, or, child, or child care. And so creating, creating uh, an environment where women are not Paske. passed over from promotions because they had to take um, several months to um, have have their child nurture the child to a certain age. We need to remove remove that kind of orientation and rather bring in a positive um, perspective so that we do not we don't penalize women because they they took the year to look after their child and as such they're passed over from promotion which then goes to male counterparts who do not have the same biological makeup and do they, do they don't share oftentimes the same level of of responsibilities so looking at broader sense of uh the the culture around uh, women who take time for childbearing, we need to remove those. And I would say women in research, um, again, these are very intensive um, pathways that often require long hours. Um, and oftentimes it is more of a burden on, on women. And as such, the ability to f create or to advance in, in research sometimes um, is, is, is a challenge for women. Um, so I would say that for every sector, we need to examine what are those negative practices that have impeded women's advancement and leadership. And those are the very things that we need to address within each sector. Let me end by this uh, story. Uh, I was very fortunate to meet um, one of the few uh, female uh, obstetricians and gynecologists in, in one of the African countries. And, um, you know, she, she shared with me that the, being the only woman in that position um, also created a lot of pressure um, because you have to perform at a level um, that is even more than what the men are performing. Uh, but it also means that she had to negotiate ways to take care of, of her young family. 
uh, while being able to meet up with the demanding hours. So again, I think we need to look carefully within each sector. Uh, what are those changes that we need to make that will remove the barriers um, from women um, advancing uh, within each sector? Back to you, Evelyn. Thank you, Dr. Polake. I just wish we had the entire evening for this discussion. I see we have nine minutes remaining, so I'll quickly ask uh, Madam Lydia the, uh, the last question, then we can wrap up this discussion. And this really also speaks to what Dr. Polake is talking about, removing barriers in all sectors beyond just health. So there's an interesting question here from Usla. And she asks, do you see a role for female cooperatives and networks for grooming women for leadership in the health sector? Madam Lydia, I know you've worked with organizations and really looked into organizational development and how this can you know, address gender inequities. So if we can uh, give a response to Usla, then we can wrap up this session. Madam Lydia. Merci beaucoup pour cette question. Uh, Peut-être avant de répondre rapidement à la question, je voudrais ajouter quelque chose qui est très important sur le leadership féminin. Euh, je pense que parfois nous prenons les critères développés dans le cadre du leadership masculin pour euh, étiqueter ou pour mesurer à quel point une femme est, joue son leadership ou pas. Je pense que c'est très important que ceux qui font la recherche viennent avec des critères pour le leadership féminin, comment les femmes rentrent en politique, comment ils sont dans l'économie et comment ils sont dans le secteur de la santé. C'est très important de pouvoir venir avec. Et je pense qu'on ne peut pas, si je vais un peu sur le terrain, euh, on ne peut pas travailler sur les questions de la santé sans toucher les aspects économiques. Parce que euh, quoi qu'on fasse, les besoins primaires des femmes sont très importants. C'est eux qui s'occupent... Euh, c'est eux qui s'occupent des familles, c'est eux qui donnent à manger dans, nos, dans notre contexte à nous. Ils sont vraiment un pivot très important. Et donc, nous travaillons, par exemple, avec beaucoup d'organisations et de groupements qui travaillent déjà dans le, domaine, dans le secteur de l'entrepreneuriat. Et rappelez-vous, nous sommes un pays sahélien et donc nous avons des programmes de résilience. C'est-à-dire qu'on commence avec les, les femmes qui... We have resilience programs that means we start with. On essaye vraiment d'introduire les questions de santé. Et nous voyons que ça marche très bien. Parce que nous avons vu que ça marche très bien. Parce que nous avons vu que ça marche très bien. Parce que nous avons vu que ça marche très bien. Ils arrivent à comprendre le contexte. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Lydia. And I know there was a bit of a hitch with the interpretation, so we apologize yeah. for that. Uh, but again, I'm hoping the French speakers have gotten to hear uh, your good views. I want to ask uh, Dr. Folake uh, just to give any closing, quick closing uh, remark in just a minute or two, then we can wrap this up. Thank you uh, very much, um, Evelyn. Um, um, yes. This has been a great honor to join the panel today and to my colleague, uh, Lydia. Really, we have to um, be very intentional about women's leadership in health. Um, the creating the awareness, creating the pathways and moving from policies to practice are the things we need to focus on. I'm very um, excited about, about the opportunities that lie ahead of many young women um, in global health. And I think that really looking at the opportunities for upskilling, creating awareness, the whole discussion around global health, diversity, equity, and inclusion is at an unprecedented level. 
And so we must be able to take this moment to really elevate the issue of women leadership in health. The policies at the global level is there. The awareness is increasing. Women, we need to be ready to move into those leadership positions. And I think we've discussed many of the, of the important points around um, institutional policies, around culture, around legislation. But I will end by saying that women themselves, uh, we need to be ready to occupy those positions. Um, again, part of the women's leadership initiative that I'm a part of, 24 amazing women leaders, is really preparing and giving us skills to take on top leadership um, positions. We want to make sure that such programs and networks and mentorship are available um, for, for many, many more women from different countries and globally, creating these networks and sharing and mentoring. I, I will say that this is a really important um, component to prepare for those leadership positions. And women's leadership is extremely powerful. We are unmatched in communications, in inspiring our teams, in empathetic leadership, and in fact, in getting results. So let me say that I look forward to a world where more women are in leadership positions in health and other sectors. I know it would be a better world, more prosperous and healthier. So thank you once again uh, for this opportunity to share today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Folake. Thank you, Madam Lydia. And most uh, thank you to your, to our entire audience for being part of this discussion. We have one minute, so we are wrapping up. And I just want to tell you that we have other exciting sessions are lined up at a hike. But what we've really heard from this session is that if your dreams don't scare you, they're not big enough. Bring on your A game. No task is too small for you. And I see a really good comment here that women leaders are more transformational than transactional. So what we are really saying is that Africa needs women leadership. And we need to address quite a number of things. Eradicate violence against women and girls, increase access to 